Have a seat. <coughs> All right. Yeah. Did we already scare away half the audience? <laughs> no, they're up there. I, I can see everyone <laughs> up there. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. As uh, the voice in the air said, I'm Mike Federley, the CEO of Forbes. And I've, uh, I've known this guy for 12 years now. And uh, I, I call him maybe the poster boy of uh, the under 30, that in 2015, he made our list. Nine years later, we said he's a billionaire. So easy peasy, right? Like, <laughs> it, it, it happens that way. And it can happen to anyone out there in the audience. But I'm, I'm sure, Ankur, that uh, it's not quite that easy. So wh why, don't you, why don't we start by kind of give the crowd a little bit about your journey. Can I maybe, because uh, this, so, this is how embarrassing it is coming here nine years later, is I'm now the old guy in the room. Uh, well, I'm a little older, but <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> um, but I remember coming to these events when I was 24, 25, yeah. and it was so much fun, mostly because everyone in the group like were friends, right? You were all coming out of school, and that's the best part about starting something big or, or working on new ideas under 30, is that you have this community of people like you who didn't choose to do the banking job, the consulting job. And you know, when I graduated college in 2011, there was still an element of being an entrepreneur wasn't cool yet. And I, I blame this on you. I, we like <laughs> to think we made it cool, right? Uh, but you've got this amazing community of people. And I think, I will tell you, nine years later even, you know, from the first 30 under 30 list that I did with you guys, Many of the people that I met here, many of the people who were on the list that same year, we're all still super close friends and do everything together. And so I say that because you cannot underestimate how valuable it is to have people like all of you who can go through these ups and downs together because it is so freaking hard. <laughs> and the cool thing is you do wake up now like nine years later and the nice thing is everyone running everything is now your friends from this event, <laughs> right? And that's, uh, it makes things a little bit easier. Well, that's great, because that was, Randall was talking about that for those who were in the audience at the beginning, how there's gonna be some couple gets married here, evidently, but it, beyond that, uh, it's about making sure that you make those connections here, because they can help uh, as you go, as each individual goes through their own journey. Uh, you, you were once, named, I think, by Inc. Magazine as the most network 21-year-old in the world. And, uh, and I can attest that you're pretty well networked, the, the people you know. How, how do you build a network like that? And what tips might you give people out in the audience? Okay, I'm gonna spend 30 seconds on that and then we'll spend some, on some other stuff. But I do think, I, look, I'll put it this way, there's nothing, there's nothing worse than networking. Let's start there. The word, <laughs> the word networking. <laughs> and there's no one who likes sitting in a room, having to trade business cards and talk. It's like small talk nightmare from hell. So we'll start there, right? I do think what happens though is when you're in a room like this and you have people who are authentically passionate about different problems, you start to attract people who are also passionate about those problems. And so the difference between building relationships and quote networking, in my opinion, is if you have a platform that you've created for yourself and you're genuinely intellectually curious, which you all are because you showed up here, <laughs> right? You're going to find other people like you, right? And there is a certain type of crazy person who tries to do the things that we all do, right? Because if you objectively look at it, it is easier and safer to go out of school and take the consulting and banking job. You get paid more, you have less stress, <laughs> right? But somehow we all wake up and we're all delusional enough to try to take on these huge problems in the world with very little certainty of success. I mean, my first startup was a failure, right? With a lot of, like, candidly doing it alone. I mean, even if you have the best co-founders, you know what they say, like, success has a thousand co-founders, failure has one. Right? It is crazy how difficult the roller coaster is. And you find yourself like attracted to people like you, and that becomes the network of the relationships. And so just by definition, if you're in the room with a platform with a lot of successful people, chances are you're gonna share that passion. Yeah, no, that, that's terrific. But so you mentioned, you know, as I said, uh, the way 
uh, on paper, it looks like you've had nothing but blue sky success, right? You went from being nominated in 2015 to being a billionaire nine years later. But I know along the way, there was uh, Kairos, there was Human, there was uh, Rhino. I mean, you have to get, first of all, so... Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, go <laughs> ahead, go ahead. So I'll start with the following. So the, I think, how many people here are trying to start companies? Just so I get a quick reference check. Okay, good, mostly still entrepreneurs, I love that. <laughs> um, so I think one of the biggest problems that has happened in starting a company is business school grads started thinking it was cool to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> business school is the single worst thing that has happened to entrepreneurship because it, it went from how do you solve a big problem to how do I create a market size opportunity matrix, <laughs> which is just total bullshit. And no matter what you think your idea is, it is going to change 15 times. The problem that you're solving doesn't change, right? And so if you look at the lessons I've learned over the different startups, like my first startup out of college was a company called Human. It is appropriately forgotten because it didn't work, <laughs> right? But that led me accidentally to running product for Tinder, which I could barely figure out my own dating life and somehow I was running this thing. <laughs> we'll get to that later. <laughs> and then from there, you know, it was 2017. Wow. We sold Tinder and Match Off fully. It was a $3 billion kind of acquisition there. And I remember I was in San Francisco and I was getting pitched by this venture capitalist. And I'll remind me to come back to venture capitalists because not a huge fan. Getting... I'm looking <laughs> up at the sponsors. We don't have any universities, MBA programs, or a venture okay. capitalist, good. so good. Good start. <laughs> so I remember I was sitting in a room, and this venture capitalist came and pitched me. He goes, I've got this idea that's going to change the world. You should really think about coming to run it. We're going to put in $100 million into it. And so I was so excited to hear about this breakthrough idea. And he proceeds to pitch me crypto kitties. I mean, this guy literally goes, imagine if you had digital, blah, 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 on the NFT, blockchain, so. NFT, yeah, this is yeah. NFT. <laughs> I was like, I remember so frustrated, I walked out of that, that room, and for those of you, have you all been to San Francisco, anybody? There's Market Street on San Francisco, this is 2017, this was like the rise of bird scooters had just raised like $2 billion, like NFTs were popping off everywhere, and in the middle of Market Street, there was a homeless person naked humping a scooter <laughs> while Teslas were stopped. <laughs> thing. And I'm thinking to myself, this is the problem with what's happened in Silicon Valley and entrepreneurship, is that people, in your own backyard, you have the worst healthcare crisis, you have a huge problem with access to housing, people don't have access to financial services, these are trillion dollar markets, and yet every, everybody wanted to be a startup founder doing NFTs. <laughs> like, that is the problem. Right? And so I think if you go back and you remember why are you starting a company in the first place? Right? And if you can say, this is the problem that I care a lot about. Here's how I think I'm going to solve it. That envision that solution, sleep on it, and ask yourself the next day, can you live in a world where that problem has not yet been solved? And if the answer is yes, and don't waste your time doing the startup, <laughs> right? But if it gnats at you every single minute after that, then maybe you'll be able to persist through the ups and downs to figure it out. So what was it though? Because um, all of the ideas that I think you had were good ones. They sounded legitimate, they sounded like they could grow. When did you realize that built was different? We yeah. haven't talked about well, built okay. yet, so give a quick a Quick background on built. People here rent? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> See, people, four years ago, no one would cheer for having to pay rent. <laughs> um, and you probably still shouldn't cheer for having to pay rent. But rent is the biggest expense for most people in this country. Right? And I remember looking at this, I was 27 at the time we started working on this, and saying, how is it that we all pay rent every single month on time? 40% of our average income goes to rent every single month. And after five years, you have nothing to show on your credit history for it. You're no closer to home ownership. 
And like, I can buy a round of drinks and get airline miles, and I pay my rent on time, and I get nothing. It's crazy, right? And so we had this really simple idea of, hey, paying rent, your biggest expense, should probably be your most rewarding expense, right? If you pay your rent on time for five years, and then you go to buy a home, they shouldn't be like, sorry, you don't have any credit history to buy a home. Like, that's insane. Mm. If you pay rent on time, you should get airline miles and hotel points. Like, I get it for everything else, right? I mean, I could fly around the world for free constantly if I could get points on my rent, right? And if you pay your rent on time, you should be closer to buying a home. Whether or not you want to buy a home is your decision, but you should have the ability, right? Now, I thought that was a simple idea. So I first went to start pitching a bunch of real estate owners, and this is 2018 now. And it was the worst. And for those of you who are founders, you'll probably hopefully relate to this. <clears throat> Everybody would tell me what a great idea it was, but it's probably not the right thing for them. Right? <laughs> it's a great idea. Come back to me when you get other people on board. Or keep me posted. Or every venture capitalist would give you some like 15-point reason for why it won't work. But of course, if I told them that somebody else gave me a term sheet, they all race to give you a term sheet. Right? This is the problem. And so the best thing we did was we identified the problem, and we said that we were going to self-finance through partners, family, and friends for as long as we possibly could. Right? Because that stage between starting a company and getting product market fit, if you make the mistake of taking venture money at that stage, you enter the rat race way too early. Because now, you have to show growth. And if you don't show growth, you can't raise a round at a higher price. And if you can't raise a round at a higher price, you're signaling to the market your startup's not working, and the next investor won't come. And the next thing you know, you're out of cash, and you have to shut down. Right? And yet, everybody's first thing is, I want to start a company. I got to go pitch venture capital. It makes no sense. Right? The best investors, it's all perfect alignment of incentives. The best investors are the ones who are commercially aligned with you, right? That's why I loved Kickstarter back in the day. Uh. If you're building a consumer product, raise money from your customers. If you're building things that need real estate partners like we did, convince them to invest so their incentives are aligned with your success, right? If you want partners in the business, don't ask them to be mentors or advisors. Ask them to invest in you, right? so that your incentives are aligned. Bring on those people as partners in the business. And so we did. And every single six months since we started the company, we've had a world-ending problem that we've had to deal with. I mean, there's just like the ups and the downs and the ups and the downs. Six months into starting this company, I don't know if you remember this. I was calling you, actually, at the time, too. <laughs> six months into starting the company, we thought paying your rent should give you airline miles and hotel points and help you save up to put to points towards a down payment on a home. Super simple idea. Our lawyers called us six months into the business and were like, I have good news, bad news. Good news is we love your idea. <laughs> bad news is it's not clear that the regulations allow to use points for a down payment, so you should probably pivot. It's a pretty shitty feeling. <laughs> yeah, well, that comes with the territory though, right? And, and so we had two choices. It was, do we pivot? Or do we believe that the core problem of renting as a path to home ownership is big enough? And we spent 18 months in Washington, D.C. because we hadn't taken venture money. So I wasn't in a rush to force a product out like I was with my first company. Right? I wasn't in a rush to show fake growth numbers because everyone loves to like, you know, put out these numbers that no way you can sustain them. But venture capitalists want to see those numbers. Otherwise, they say you can't, they won't give you money. It's this really terrible system. And so we spent 18 months fighting to get this thing approved. And in October 2019, we got Fannie, Freddie, and FHA to agree that paying your rent will now qualify people in this country for a home mortgage. And paying your rent can earn you points that you can use to cover a down payment. That's cool, right? <laughs> um, today, you know, like, it, we didn't, it took us four years to launch. That's unacceptable by VC standards. Right? No, it's interesting. I, I've heard that from a lot of entrepreneurs, that <clears throat> the first thing they're supposed to do is go raise VC money, and then they're validated. Uh. And I've heard also, from yourself in particular, that uh, 
that can be the worst thing for a company. So that, that's interesting and stuff. Really, it's not that they're bad people. It's perfectly aligned incentives. If you're an early stage fund, you want to drive valuation markups so that you can then go back to your investors because it's going to be 10 years till you get paid out on an exit. So you got to show your investors paper markups. And if you do that, you can raise your next fund and the next fund and the next fund. And if you don't, then you won't. <laughs> so it's not that it's like crazy or that they're not smart. They're perfectly brilliant at what they do. It's just not aligned with an early stage entrepreneur. Yeah. Yep. Hey, let me ask you, we, these sessions always go way too fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But what, um, you know, as I mentioned, I've known Ankur for 12 years. I knew his father beforehand, met the whole family at an event. I walked away from the event going, oh my God, what is this family? <laughs> it's like these, they all have these crazy ideas. And your father builds himself as a limitless dreamer. And what, what was it like growing up in a family like that? Because it, it was very apparent you yeah. all had very big ambitions. All right, so I'll use the last two minutes here to tell, us, tell a story. So my, my parents... Well, we, we, we also want to hear about the wedding in, uh, in Egypt, as more people said, is this the guy who had the wedding in Egypt? So uh, <laughs> I did touch get married upon in that April. Too. Someone finally said yes to me, so I'm, Good. I'm now married. <laughs> um, I, uh, so look, my parents are immigrants, and it was like, I got a first-hand look at what it meant to have the American dream here, right? I mean, my dad grew up in a dirt poor village in India. Like when I say dirt poor, like he literally had to study on dirt floors, <laughs> right? Came to this country with no money, like many other immigrants, and hustled and fought his way through to the point where like I tell this story sometimes, when he married my mom, they didn't have enough money to go on a honeymoon. And so he, <laughs> he was sitting there thinking to himself, how do I pay for a honeymoon? And he had this crazy idea. He said, if I send my resume to 20 companies in cities all around the country that we'd want to go visit, one of them <laughs> might pay for a ticket to come out for an interview. And That's so he right. did. And so he sent his resume, and one startup out of Seattle called Microsoft <laughs> responded saying, hey, come out for an interview. And long story short, they did their honeymoon in Seattle, and that's how we ended up. I was born in Seattle, right? And so... <laughs> This is like the type of hustle that we forget about, right? It's that how do you get really creative with limited resources to solve problems? And this is another reason why raising too much money too early is mm. dangerous, right? Because no matter how smart you are, you start solving problems with money first versus how do you get creative with a win-win-win to make things work, right? And um, honestly, that mentality has stayed with us. Like, it's just been, you know... I like to say my little sister, my little brother should be the ones up here. My little sister started a women's vaginal health company called Evie Bio. She's like the real rock star in the family. My little brother's like on his fire doing his, he's doing mortgage servicing. Like, but it's because it's just a mentality, right? And if you see a problem that you get stuck on and you can't stop thinking about it, like that is the company you should start. This sounds like uh, the real entrepreneurs of, of Seattle <laughs> featuring the Jane family. We're now family, New Yorkers. So we'll We're fake there. New Yorkers, but we live there for You're seven years. You're not New Yorkers, all right. We love New York. We're never leaving. No, that's uh, great. Well, once again, we are out of time, and thank you so much for joining us. Inspiration to under 30s everywhere. Thanks for having uh, me. And it's a great company that you're building, and good luck with continuing that. Well, thanks for having there me, you Mike. Go, man. Yeah.